Hello! This lecture is going to show you how to create frequency distribution tables and graphs for situations where you're working with two variables at the same time. So I'll spend quite a bit of time explaining the difference between a joint frequency distribution, a joint relative frequency distribution, and then a joint relative to group total frequency distribution table, and kind of the important differences among those three different types of displays of data and which one is superior to the others. And then I'll jump into looking at scatter diagrams and regression lines that are often used when you're looking at the relationship between two interval or ratio variables. And many of you have probably seen scatter diagrams when you're looking at like results from a correlation analysis. But we won't do correlation in this class. We'll just look at scatter diagrams and try to interpret relationships between variables. All right, so as I mentioned before, in this lecture, you're going to see three different types of joint frequency distribution tables. The first one is just based on the frequencies. Then we're going to look at percentages. And then we're going to look at conditional percentages, where we just compare different levels of one variable within another level of the variable that we wish to make comparisons on. That sounds really weird now. It'll make sense once you see some examples. Now, these first three different types of tables and graphs I'm going to show you are going to be based on frequency-based data. And then we'll end on a scatter diagram where we're looking at the relationship between raw scores on two numeric variables with scatter diagrams. And if we have a strong enough relationship in the scatter diagram with regression lines. So again, joint frequency distribution tables are really designed for a situation where you want to look at frequencies for two variables simultaneously or at the same time. And typically, these type of tables are reserved for situations where one, at least one of your variables is or nor nominal or not truly numeric. And the way this works, you have the levels of one variable represented along the rows, so kind of going you know, horizontally, and then the levels of the other variable represented along the columns and where the rows and columns intersect in each cell, you would count how many people fit the criteria for each variable. So like if you, for instance, were looking at um, sex, right? So male, female, and then comparing like study time. So um, no study time, maybe moderate study time, and lots of study time, right? So these people would be males who studied a lot, for instance. And you'll see more examples of that in a second. Now, before we move on, I want to point out that if one of those variables is a variable that you want to make comparisons based on, if you're wanting to look at a relationship between two variables or make a comparison between, for instance, males and females, you want to make sure that whatever groups you wish to compare are represented along the rows. And that's going to make a lot more sense when we get to those um, conditional frequency distribution tables. But for now, just keep in mind that any groups we wish to compare, those groups should be represented along the horizontal or the rows there. So let's look at an example that we'll use throughout the um, different dis distribution tables I'm going to show you. So let's start off with saying that, let's say, the Apple Store is considering implementing a no-check policy before Black Friday. So they're concerned that people who pay with checks make the line longer, people have to wait longer, and they're really trying to see if they can just get rid of checks altogether on Black Friday to save time. But before they do that, they want to collect some data the Friday before Black Friday to see how many of their big spending customers, you know, the ones they're really concerned about, are using checks. And not only that, but they want to see if there's a sex-based difference in who uses checks more because they really want to be careful about alienating their female customers who tend to spend more money throughout the year. So in this example, they do want to compare males versus females. So you'll see in the examples, that will be the basis of the rows in the tables. And they want to look at the different payment types based on sex. So now let's take a look at an example of a joint frequency distribution table and also a bar chart that I'll show you in a minute. So if we look at this right here, you'll see that this is our raw data. And so each row represents one customer. And for each, um, for each customer, we know their sex and we know their payment type. So for this first customer, they were a female who paid cash. Second customer that spent, you know, at least $1,000 was a female who paid credit and so, so on and so forth. Now, this is kind of hard to decipher. If you look at this raw data, it's not going to be really easy to look at the relationship between sex and payment or to figure out if males or females use checks more. So to, get that, to make a step in the right direction, you could put this into a joint frequency distribution table, where now we know that four people in this data paid with cash and were female. Also, we know that 13 females 
were in the sample and 17 males were in the sample. So these grand totals tell you how many people fit this category regardless of payment method. Whereas these grand totals will tell you how many people used each payment method regardless of sex. So for instance, eight people paid with credit. This grand total tells you there's 20 people in the sample overall. And you'll see here there's 20 customers in this sample. So this table is useful if you just kind of want to know among everybody that we sampled, what were their characteristics. But it's not really useful if you want to compare females versus males. Think about it. If we look at this example, it would look at face value like, oh crap, we really care about checks, right? And it looks like females are using checks more than males. So maybe we shouldn't implement a no check policy because we'll be more likely to alienate the female customers. But if you think about it, there's more females than males. So if you look at all of these numbers, they're all higher for females because we have more females to begin with. So this table will be problematic if you are wanting to make comparisons based on sex, but it is useful because again, you can see how many of each customer fit each category. And maybe you look at this and you go, oh, well, only five out of 20 customers paid with check anyway, so maybe I'm not worried about it to begin with. But again, not so useful for sex-based comparisons because we have a different number of males and females. Just to show you how this looks in a bar chart, which most people prefer, the visuals are nice. Um, I just want to show you how you would construct this and kind of how to make sense of it. There will be an Excel video that will show you how to create one of these separately. So let's just look and see how this corresponds to the table. So the first thing I want to mention is that our x-axis is going to represent whatever category we had for the rows. And then our y-axis is going to represent the frequencies, so all of these. And then the different colored bars are going to represent what we had along the columns in our table. And the way I construct this, it's really nice because you'll see that all the females are here, all the males are here, and we can just make comparisons based on that. So if we look at this, all right, so among the females, four paid cash, that aligns with this, right? Among the females, three paid with check, oh, that adds up, and among the females, six paid with credit. So you see that pan out right there. And then you see the three, two, and two, three, two, and two, cash, check, credit. So just to make sure that you understand how the table matches up with the graph here. Again, we can't make sex-based comparisons just yet because you can see that all the bars for male are lower and all the bars for female are higher because we have more females in the sample. So just be cautious with interpreta interpretations of this sort of thing. So because we are collecting this data the Friday before Black Friday to make assumptions about what's going to happen with big spenders on Black Friday, maybe we're not that interested in the frequencies in general. Maybe we want to look at the percentage, right? So we know that there's going to be more, probably more big spenders on Black Friday than there are here, and we're just using sample data. So we can't really predict that there's going to be three females on Black Friday that pay with checks, right? We don't really know. We're probably going to have a totally different frequency over all of customers. So by converting these frequencies into percentages, you can then say, oh, well, not that I think three females are going to come in, or that I think three customers are going to come in, they're going to be female, and they're going to pay with a check. We can then turn that into a percent. So if you have 100 customers that day, you could predict that 15 are going to be females who pay with checks. Now, we're still focusing on the overall number of customers here. We're not doing any kind of, you know, within each sex, what are the different payment types, right? So if you look at these percentages, you're going to see that across the board, 20 is right here, that grand total. And that corresponds to our sample size right here. Now, if you look at this formula, you'll see that the numerator of this fraction is F with a subscript I. That just stands for the frequency for the group of interest. I stands for interest. So you'll see. 4 is here, 3 is here, and that corresponds to the frequency within each cell. Now you'll also see that we take, you know, for instance, 4 out of 20 customers were cash who were paid with cash who were female. Then we're going to multiply that by 100 to just percentify it, turn it into a percentage. So you'll see that throughout. If you look here, right, if we look at males who paid with cash, 3 out of 20 were males who paid with cash, 
multiply that by 100, you get 15%. Now in this class, I'm not going to require you to do manual calculations like this. I'm going to show you how to do this stuff in Excel, but I want you to understand where the numbers are coming from so that you can make sense of the values that you see in Excel. If you just keep looking and look at all these, you'll see that that pattern is consistent right here. We've got 13 out of 20, 13 out of 20 times 100. So now instead of saying, well, on this particular day, 13 customers were female, we could say, we predict that 65% of big spending customers will be female. And that's richer information that you can use to make predictions across time. All right. So now you can see the original joint frequency distribution table and graph and then how that transcribes into this joint relative frequency distribution table. Now note that the calculations aren't here. And if you ever would present this in a board meeting or anywhere else, you're not going to have all those calculations. You're just going to have the final percentages that you ended up with. So I just want to show you at this point, you can see that roughly they look identical, right? They have the same shape. So when you convert frequencies into percentages, the shape doesn't change. This six, is still the tallest bar that represents 30% of the sample. Now, a couple other things I want to point out about comparing your joint frequency distribution graph to your joint relative or percentage-based frequency distribution graph. So if you look at this, all of these numbers added together are going to equal 20. So the 20 total people in this sample. Now, if you look at this graph over here, you're going to see that the sum of all the numbers, or sum of all the percentages, equals 100. So you add all these together, you get 100%. If you add all these together, you're going to get 20. And that makes sense, because 20 is 100% of the sample. So if we look at this first graph right here, if you didn't have these little percentages and you weren't paying attention, you may think there is a ton of customers who are female and pay with a credit card. because so this bar is really tall. So it's a little misleading. So anytime that your frequency axis, your Y axis, represents percentages, it's best to format it so that 0% is at the bottom and 100% is at the top. This gives you a more realistic picture of the actual you know, percentage of customers who are female and pay with credit and all the other categories as well. It also doesn't overstate kind of the differences between variables. Here it looks like there's a huge difference, but here it looks a little bit smaller. So just as a best practice, if you ever are looking at relative frequencies and you put them in a graph, you should have the bottom of the y-axis be 0% and the top of the y-axis be 100%. Now keep in mind, this is the same general shape. The shape doesn't change from the original, even from the one on the previous slide with the frequencies, but you can see that this one kind of overstates the differences between groups and makes it seem like groups that aren't really that common are more common. So just as a recap, we started off with our joint frequency distribution table right here. Then we converted that to a joint relative frequency distribution table based on percentages right here. So four out of 20 or 20% 20 of all customers were females who paid with cash on this particular day or the big spenders. But now let's get back to our original question. I've already kind of alluded to this, but let's look at it more concretely. So remember, we were wanting to see if there was like sex-based payment preferences for big purchases. But at this point, we're unsure because we haven't controlled for the fact that we have almost twice as many females as males in our sample. So in the next set of slides, we're going to control for that and look at um, conditional probabilities instead. And at this point, we don't really know if results suggest that a no-check policy would alienate big spending females. But at this point, we can see that overall, if we look at checks, there's a higher percentage of female check users than there is of male check users among all customers, but not, again, controlling for the fact that we have more females in our sample than males. So now we're going to get into the territory where we can make comparisons based on sex. And remember, I told you that you want to make sure that the groups that you wish to compare are the basis of the rows. So you'll see that sex, male and female, those are based on the rows. You're going to see, too, that when we do this, we are taking the frequency for the group of interest, so for instance, right here, and we're dividing it by the sample size for the group of interest. So instead of taking 4 divided by 20, 
we're going to say, okay, we want to just look at females only. And four out of 13 females are paying with cash. So you'll kind of see how that plays out, right? Here. So four out of 13 females paid with cash. Again, multiply that by 100 to percentify it. And you end up with 30.77% here. Now let's look at males who paid with cash. Three out of now seven is our denominator. Can you see that here? Times 100. So just within males, 42.86% paid with cash. So you see now we're controlling for the fact that we have more females than males. Now also notice that these percentages down here haven't changed. We can still see that only 25% of people paid with checks because our denominator here is still out of 20, right here. And now you'll see that these percentages are different because we're only looking at the 13 in the row and the seven in this row. So you're gonna see 100% for those groups that we're actually using as the basis of comparison. So I just want to point out that whenever I show you a table with calculations in it, that's never going to be a table that you would present at a board meeting or in any way, shape, or form present. But um, that's what gets you to this nice, beautiful table. And this would be something that you would want to present, not with all the calculations in it. So if you look at the previous slide, you'll see that these are the final results for all those computations. And I just want to show you how these now refer to this graph here and how those two things align. So remember, I said best practice, if you're, percent, if you're looking at percentages, you want to start at zero, end at 100. So that's what I did here. And you'll also see now, okay, out of all females, 30.77% paid cash. Female, cash, 30.77%. So you see how that drives. So now at this point, we can start to answer some questions about our data. So do results suggest any clear sex-based payment preferences for a big purchase? And at this point, we can be confident and we can say, yeah, if we look at this just within the females, it actually looks like the females prefer credit, whereas the males prefer cash. So we can see that clearly. We're controlling for the fact there's more females than males, and we can see that just within females, credit's more popular. And just within males, cash is more popular. And back to the bigger question, do results suggest that a no-check policy would alienate big spending females more than males? Now remember, on the previous um, tables and graphs, it looked like, oh yeah, females are using checks more. But they're not. We just had more females in the sample. So now that we've controlled for that, we can see that the answer is no, right? So if we look at these different check, right, and check, we can see that males are actually slightly more likely to pay with check than females. So if we're going to alienate customers, it's not going to be females more than males based on this data. So again, here's our beautiful conditional probability table or joint relative to group total frequency distribution table, however you want to call it, where we are just looking within males and within or within females and within males separately. So let me show you how this differs from that joint relative frequency distribution table that we made earlier, where we were basing our percentages on the overall number of people in the sample, not sex-based differences or males and females separately. So if we look at this, you'll see that, as I mentioned before, the sum of all of these percentages equals 20, or 100, 100%. But when you look at this, you'll see that within females, the sum of all these percentages equals 100%. And then separately, males, the sum of these percentages equals 100%. And that is the best way to display data that's conditional, where you're controlling for different group sizes and you're dividing by the group total, not the overall total. You want all those bars for each group to add up to 100. So by using the techniques that I've showed you and making sure the groups that you want to compare, the basis of the rows, that's going to get you what you want in Microsoft Excel. So just showing you how if you showed this to somebody, it looks completely different than if you showed them the second picture. So you can really be misleading with data. And overall, if you're wanting to make sex-based comparisons, this is going to be the ideal way to display that. If you just want to know kind of roughly what percentage of your customers are 
doing what based on their sex and their purchase type, then this is just fine. But if you're wanting to make comparisons or look at relationships between variables, you need to do those conditional relative frequencies that you see right here. So now let's shift our focus away from frequency distribution tables and graphs and move on to looking at scatter diagrams and also regression lines. So this is really useful when you're looking at the relationship between two interval or ratio variables. And as I'll demonstrate, if you ever have a situation where you see there's a pretty strong relationship, then you want to go on and create a regression line to make predictions about any kind of values in the population based on a sample data that you have. So again, a scatter diagram is really used to display the relationship between two variables. And those variables are typically labeled as X and Y. So keep in mind in a little bit when you see a table displaying this data that we're not looking at a frequency distribution table. The first column, x, represents the values for the first variable. The second column, or the y column, represents the values for the second variable, not the frequencies for the values. So just keep that in mind as we look at these different tables in a little bit. Now it's important to note that scatter diagrams can really depict three different characteristics of a relationship. So one is form. And there's two different types of form. There's linear, where there's a consistent increase or decrease in values. Or there's a curvilinear relationship, where you see kind of a, a U or an inverse U, where um, it's like as X increases, Y increases, and then it starts to decrease at a certain point, or vice versa. And I'll show you what both of those look like. Also, the direction of relationships. So we're really going to focus mostly on linear relationships in this class. I just want to introduce you to curvilinear relationships. But the, um, the direction of linear relationships is really what we're going to focus on. So you can have a positive relationship, meaning that as x increases, y tends to increase, or as x decreases, y tends to decrease, or a negative relationship, which is also the same as an inverse relationship, where as x increases, y tends to decrease, and as x decreases, y tends to increase. And I'll show, I'll get into more detail on this here in a minute. Then the final characteristic of a relationship that's depicted in a scatter diagram is the strength. So strong is consistent, moderate is kind of consistent, and then weak is kind of like totally inconsistent, where changes in x don't really have any predictable relationship with changes in y. So for now, let's focus on the form of the relationship. So kind of the shape that the data points form when you plot them in a scatter diagram. And I'll show you a ton of those here in a second. So there's a situation where there's no relationship or no pattern. And then again, if there's a relationship, typically it's either curvilinear, like a U shape, or linear, consistent increase or decrease. So let's first take a look at a curvilinear relationship between stressful work events and performance appraisal scores. So real quick, I just want to show you how this table corresponds to this scatter diagram or scatter graph. So if we look at this, you'll see that this first column represents each person's level of stressful work events, how many they experienced. So each row represents one person, one employee. And for each person's score, of stressful work events, they have a corresponding performance appraisal score. So each person has two values associated with them, stressful work events and performance appraisal score. So you'll see that this first person is represented by this dot right here. So we go to the zero along the x-axis and then find the 50 along the y-axis and boom, that's where that dot comes from. Let's do another one. So this other person, they had a 25 stressful work events in the past quarter, and their performance appraisal score was a 100. So you would see 25 is roughly here, 100 is here, and bam, there is their dot. So if you look at this, it appears that with low levels of stress, you have lower levels of performance. Then there's like this sweet spot of stress right here in the middle, where a moderate level of stress tends to lead to optimal performance. And then when stress just gets way too high to cope with, performance dips again. So it's almost looking like the employees aren't very motivated when there's a low stress environment or a really high stress environment, but if there's a moderate level of stress, you see the biggest spike in performance.
Now, it's important to note that for all of these, this is not a causation type of thing. You can't say that stressful work events causes performance based on this. This is correlational, and correlation does not equal causation. You could just say that, in general, those who experience a moderate level of work stress tend to have higher levels of performance than those who experience low or really high levels of work stress. Now, here's another curvilinear relationship, but this is where the high points are really at the high and low end of the x-axis. So if we look at this relationship between age and car insurance premiums, again, note that where these are corresponding to these dots, right? So 18 is like here-ish, 140 is right here, bam, there's the dot for that person. So now that you can understand where those dots are coming from based on the data, let's look at the relationship here and what it suggests. So it looks like younger drivers and older drivers have much higher premiums because they're higher risk, right? When you first start driving, you don't know what you're doing. And then maybe the older they get, you get, the more reckless you are because you're like, ah, I'm on death's door anyway, who cares? Or maybe you're senile or whatever. You're a higher risk when you get older. Then there's this beautiful sweet spot between 40 and 60 where your car insurance premium, holding all other things constant, like number of accidents and DUIs, is going to be lower than when you're younger or older. So this curvilinear relationship and the one before just demonstrates situations where you don't have a consistent increase or decrease as one variable increases or decreases. There's kind of like a point where things change a little bit in the middle. And this is less common than uh, the linear relationships that we're going to focus on next. So now let's take a look at a linear relationship. And linear just kind of means line, right? So you'll see diagonal lines if it's a linear relationship in terms of how the data plots out. Yet again, let's look and see where is this person, okay? 0, 65, 0, 65. There they are. And then this would be the person that's 0 or 60. So now we're looking at the relationship between time studying and quiz grades. And so you can see here that this data has a linear form. As studying increases, quiz grade increases consistently. It's not curvilinear. In fact, we haven't gotten there yet, but this would be a strong positive relationship between studying and quiz grades. But that's all about direction and strength. And right now, we're just focusing on form. So here's another example of a linear relationship. This one is strong and negative. Again, we'll get to that in a minute. But you'll see here that consistently, as you do more cardio, your percentage of body fat is decreasing. There's not a point where it gets higher. You know, your body fat increases if you work out more or anything like that. It's just a nice linear trend that's consistent across time. So now let's shift our focus from form to the direction of the relationship. And just keep in mind that we're really only going to focus on linear relationships from here on out. So a positive relationship, and I've mentioned this before, but this is when X and Y tend to change in the same direction. So those who have higher scores for whatever X is tend to have higher scores for whatever Y is. And conversely, lower scores on X tend to be related to lower scores on Y. So don't be tricked when you see something that's lower and lower. That doesn't mean negative. It means positive. The biggest thing with positive is it's the same direction. They're changing in the same way. As one increases, the other increases. As one decreases, the other decreases. Negative is just an inverse relationship. They're changing in the opposite direction. So those who have higher scores on X tend to have lower scores on Y, and those who have lower scores on X tend to have higher scores on Y. So let me go ahead and show you some examples of positive versus negative relationships. So here again is our strong positive relationship between studying and quiz grades. Now, although you can kind of see it here, right, as these get higher, these get higher, it's much easier to see these when you put them into a scatter diagram like you see here. So if you see an upward slope in your data points, that is a sign that you have a positive relationship. And again, you can see that more studying, higher quiz grade. Less studying tends to result in a lower quiz grade. So high X, high Y, low X, low Y in this situation. And that's what makes it positive. Now let's take a look at a negative relationship again, looking at hours of cardio per week and percent body fat. 
Yet again, you could look at this and you could see that increases, decreases as you go down, right? So you can kind of see that there, but it's really beautiful when you plot it in a scatter diagram and you see that you have a downward slope. And just to demonstrate, more exercise tends to be related to less body fat. Less exercise related to more body fat. So as X increases, Y decreases, and as X decreases, Y increases. And that's what makes it a negative relationship. So now let's move on to the final characteristic of a relationship, which is strength. Or in other words, how consistent is the pattern in your data? So a strong relationship is a more consistent relationship where the data points are more linear. So closer to a straight line if you plot them out. Now keep in mind, strength and direction are two separate things. These would both be strong relationships. It's just this one's positive and this one's negative, but they're both very linear and consistent, where it's kind of like a predictable pattern of relationships. Oh, based on this, I can tell that higher X is consistently related to higher Y. There's also moderate relationships that are less consistent. And this is when data points are in a scatter plot, but they're less linear and more scattered, but you can still tell the direction of the relationship. So kind of like something that looks like this. It's not cooperating as much as I'd like, but you can see that it's negative, but it's scattered. Or here's a positive moderate, it's kind of letting me do it. It's scattered, but it's still pretty linear. You can tell it's positive. Um, one way that the textbook describes it is if you can draw a football around it, it's a moderate shape. So like, whereas this is more of like a straight line. Finally, we have weak relationships. And this is where it's just completely inconsistent. There's really no pattern. It's like a shotgun blast. You don't even know the direction. It's just a big spread. And if you drew a circle around the data points, it would look more like a circle than a football or like a skinny little hot dog or line. So this would be an example of the strongest possible relationship you could have, where consistently, and you see it's a perfect straight line, boom, for each 500 calorie increase, you see a 50 pound weight increase consistently, right? So 2,000 plus 500, 2,500 plus 500, 200 plus 50, 250 plus 50. That is a perfect, strong relationship. If you calculated a correlation coefficient for it, it would be one, but I'm not gonna make you responsible for that. But this is really rare in reality. Um, typically there is variability in the pattern of relationships and you don't see a perfect linear relationship. So this would be an exa example of moderate relationship where you kind of see there's a spread, but if you draw around, you can see it's kind of like a football. You can also clearly see that it's a positive relationship. So if the points are spread, but you can detect the direction, you'd call that a moderate relationship. In this case, between how many siblings you grew up with and the number of children that you eventually have. So again, it's spread out, but you can tell the direction of the relationship. It's also important to note that that previous um, perfect strength, it doesn't have to look like that to be strong. If it looked kind of like, I'm trying to do it, but it won't let me, there we go. Like that, that would still be, <clears throat> that would still be a strong relationship. The data points are pretty clustered and they're quite linear. Now here's an example of a weak relationship. So the relationship, and this is based on actual research, the relationship between your grade and anatomy and physiology, and then having um, a percentage of passing stations in the objective structured clinical examination for nurses. So based on this data, it looks like there's no relationship between your grade and A&P and how well you do in performance appraisals as a nurse. And you can see here, we can't even tell the direction of this relationship. It's all scattered and it's not consistent at all. You can also see that in the numbers, right? So these are listed in numeric order from lowest to highest, but you really don't see a clear pattern here when that happens, right? Like, oh, this is lower and then higher, and then it gets lower again, then higher, and then lower and then higher, and then lower and higher, and it's not consistent at all. So here's another example of a scatter diagram, and you can see that the raw data is up here, and it's kind of broken down in columns. So this represents one, 
day. This represents another day. This represents another day. This represents another day of data collection. And what we're really looking at is the number of geniuses on duty at the Genius Bar at the Apple Store and how that's related to wait time in minutes. And each dot really represents a different data collection period. So if we look at this, try to think about it, maybe pause this video and ask yourself, what type of relationship is this? What is the form? What is the strength? And what is the direction? So hopefully you realize that this is a strong, negative, linear relationship. It's strong because the data points are really close together. They're pretty clustered. It's negative because you see a downward slope, right? More geniuses tend to be related to fewer wait time, or less wait time. Fewer geniuses, more wait time. And it's linear because you can see that it's not a curvy shape, right? It's a consistent pattern, increase, increase, or sorry, increase, decrease, decrease, increase. Now, if you had to explain this in plain English, you could say there tends to be a shorter wait time when more geniuses are on duty. But what you would not want to say is that more geniuses guarantee shorter wait times, because remember, correlation does not equal causation. Now, finally, I want to briefly introduce you to something called a regression line. I could spend a whole lecture or a whole semester really on regression, but I'm not going to do that to you. I just want to show you kind of the basics here. So whenever you have a situation where you have a strong relationship between two variables or even like a moderate to strong relationship, it can be really useful to generate a regression line in Excel. And I'll show you how to do that in a separate video. But the regression line kind of gives you the line that's the best fit for the data that you have in your sample. So you can see that this line is kind of cutting across the middle of all those data points. And what that line produces is a way to predict values in the population. So for instance, and there's a whole theory that goes behind this and why this works. Don't worry about that. Just know that your regression line allows you to make predictions in the population based on strong relationships and samples. So when you look at this, what we can see is that in our actual data, on a day where we had 20 geniuses, the wait time was 0.6 minutes. In the population, you'd kind of predict the exact same thing. What if we had a situation where we had like 22 geniuses on duty? Well, in the population, just in general, we would predict the wait times to be pretty darn close to zero. So you can see the line doesn't always fit the data points perfectly. And the weaker the relationship, the less able you are to have a regression line that fits the data points. But this line gives you an opportunity to make predictions about data outside of what you collected. Because remember, statistics is really about taking a sample and making predictions about the future or predictions about what you would see if you had all of the wait times and for all of the days with the number of geniuses. So that's really what the regression line allows you to do. You can pick a point here, find where that line is, and make a prediction about what relationship you would expect to see. Now, finally, here is that very useful table that you saw in the previous lecture that summarizes when to use what based on the type of data. And it tells you which kind of table and graph to display. So you'll see here that when you're looking at the frequencies or percentages for two variables with similar group sizes or in situations where you just care about the overall frequency, you're not looking at relationships or comparisons, then you could use a joint frequency distribution table, if you just care about frequencies, or a joint relative frequency distribution table if you care about percentages. Then you could just convert your table into a bar chart if you want to display it graphically. If you want to look at the frequencies for two variables, but they have dissimilar group sizes, and you're also interested in making comparisons or looking at a relationship, that's when you need to base your percentages on the group total, not the overall total. And you would do a conditional relative to group total frequency distribution table, and then you could turn that into a bar chart. And then finally, if you're looking at scores for two numeric variables in one single group, and you think those two variables may be related, the best way to display those is with a scatter plot. And if you have a strong enough relationship and you want to make predictions about the population, then you could construct a regression line in your scatter plot.